Michigan Out of Doors Online is brought to you in part by by Tri-County Logging. Experienced in sustainable forestry practices, Tri-County Logging can help you manage your property by keeping your woods healthy and generate income. Serving southern and mid-Michigan for nearly 50 years, tricountylogging.com. Hi everyone, welcome to Michigan Out of Doors. I'm Jenny olson Silic, and we've got an all new show in store for you this week. We're gonna take a break from fishing and we're gonna take a look at a couple of unique things to do around the state this time of year. I'll take you to the tip of the thumb where we check out a really unique rock formation that draws visitors from near and far. You won't wanna miss that story. And speaking of fishing, if you've got some fish in the freezer, we're gonna show you a great recipe to cook those up. Jimmy's also got some excitement in store for us this week too. Well, that's right, Jenny. We do have another story on this week's show. And if you watch the show on a regular basis, about a month or so back, I was able to head over to Saginaw Bay and do a little walleye fishing with my boys with Brian Miller. Well, Brian said that he was really into reloading. So I recently went down to the Plymouth area and was able to learn a lot about reloading. And I think you will too. It's a really good show this week. You stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger. It's time for Michigan Out of Doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze, Dancing on the pine forest floor The autumn colors catch your eyes Here come the crystal winter skies It's Michigan, Michigan out of doors What a beautiful day in the woods Someday our children all will see This is their finest legacy The wonder and the love of Michigan As the wind comes whispering through the trees The sweet smell of nature's in the air Great Lakes to the quiet stream, shining like a sportsman's dream. It's a love of Michigan we all share. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by By Country Smokehouse, a sportsman's meat processor and Michigan destination since 1988. Offers a variety of homemade smoked meats and Michigan-made products in-store and online. The Country Smokehouse features an outdoor barbecue and bar. Details at countrysmokehouse.com. Michigan's hunters and anglers are essential partners to the health of the state's wildlife and habitats. The Michigan Wildlife Council is dedicated to ensuring our hunting and fishing heritage and Michigan's natural resources are preserved for future generations. By Green Mark Equipment. Green Mark Equipment is a John Deere dealership network in southwest Michigan and northern Indiana. Green Mark provides sales and services to farmers, commercial businesses, large property owners, and homeowners. Information about pricing and products available can be found online at greenmarkequipment.com. Jimmy, I got started in reloading at a pretty early age. I was about 14, and I had um, uh, my father used to work for the RCBS Reloading Company uh, many, many years ago, and I started getting into hunting. My outdoor passion started increasing, and I acquired my first deer rifle. And our friend who worked for RCBS sent me some reloading dies, and that started all from there. I think you know how I got into reloading is how most people kind of get into the reloading, and it's usually a few reasons. Uh, one, they want to shoot more and uh, shoot more often. Uh, you know, two, ammo is, ammo is expensive these days, and so reloading affords you the um, uh, ability to, to shoot more, but to shoot more economically as well. And I think, you know, a third reason is also because I, um, I have a real uh, sense of pride when we put things together, like people who make their own arrows or build their own knives or axes. And when you create uh, something that you've made, and you go harvest a deer or harvest big game with it, uh, there, there's a lot of fun, a lot of sense of pride in that as well. I'll show you some uh, basic operations. Really, there's two things to reloading. The first will be um, once, you, uh, once you fire the shell, how do you get that prepped and ready so then you can reload that back with a primer, powder, and bullet. Um, and then the second thing would be uh, some of the equipment here that uh, I have on display. Um, but I think uh, from a safety standpoint, uh, as I mentioned, you want to have a reloading manual and make sure you look at those if you're just first starting out and please follow the directions. Um, you know, one of the things that I've learned uh, when I started reloading and still do to this day is to not to try to attempt to do this when you're tired, um, if you have a lot of stress, if you're distracted um, or otherwise because, um, you know, you don't, you don't want to get into a situation where you, where, uh, you overcharge uh, a cartridge and all of a sudden you shoot that in your gun and there could be an injury. 
Um, that's the basic of basics of the basics. When Brian told me about the improvements you can get when it comes to accuracy when reloading, I have to say I was interested to see just what you needed to get started. Basic setup for anyone wanting to start. There's a reloading manual, a set of dies for the caliber or calibers you want to start reloading, a case lube kit, and this helps you run it up into the die to be able to resize it without getting the case stuck. This isn't necessary, but I always have a bullet puller because I'm human and I make mistakes. <laughs> a caliper, you're going to want to have that for measuring the length of your bullets and being able to make adjustments. A powder measure, these come in an electronic, uh, electronic scale like I have here, or a manual one, one I've used for years. A powder funnel, a case block, so you can set loaded ammunition in or resize cases in. And then I have two single stage uh, presses, but one single stage press will work. And you know, you can get this off uh, fairly economically to get started. All right, well, first starts um, with, with your fired cases. And you'll notice uh, that that primer has been dented in and there's no bullet. So that has been fired in a rifle. And this is how the reloading process starts. What I do um, is, however you do this, there's a lot of different variations to this, but I still am old school and use what's called a case lube pad. Now they have an aerosol that you can, you can spray it with. And just make sure you have a nice even coating. It's probably hard to see there. And your whole goal is to resize this case and knock that primer out so you can get it back into your, uh, into your firearm. Put it in the die and then just run it up into the resizing die. And the primer knocks out. You pull it back out. And I have a resized case ready for reloading. Uh, these cases and all factory ammunition come with a certain dimension of the case. And the whole goal is to get this close back to that resized case so it'll fit back into your rifle. Because once, once you shoot this, this case expands in your chamber and it doesn't go back to original dimensions. Jimmy, I'm gonna, we're started the process of loading up the case. So I have a case that's ready to load. Uh, no primer. It's empty. And so we're starting this process. Um, the first step we'll do is three steps, it's that simple, is we'll put a primer in the back end and that primer has a little ignition to it. That's what makes the powder, ignites the explosion, burns the powder and uh, makes the, gets that bullet moving out of your barrel. Um, so I'm using something very rudimentary. Um, they have hand priming tools. Um, this has a primer itself, a priming tool built into the press. And so I put that primer in there, seated it in You'll see that that primer is firmly seated. And this takes this part of the process takes a little feel. So when you when you kind of seat it in, you'll kind of feel it bottom out on the on the bottom of that primer pocket, and that's pretty important to get good primer pocket connection. Jimmy, here we are now going to now that we have <clears throat> now that we have this case primed, we need to put powder and then ultimately seat a bullet at the right depth. Let me set that in here. And so I know from my manuals, let me turn my, uh, I have electronic scale and these are wonderful to use. Um, you know, they do speed up your time with reloading. You'll see how I have that set to zero. Let me zero it out again to reset it. And now that's at zero. They have powder tricklers. Um, mine unfortunately just recently broke. But I'm going to set this charge to weigh to 46.5 grains. And I'm using H4350 in a 7 millimeter 08. That's a safe load that I've worked up to. And it's also quite an accurate load, too. So you'll see that going up. And it's important to get the powder measurement within 0 0.10 accurate of... You'll see it's 46.5. So every single time, once you found your load, uh, or any or any of your reloads, um, you know, make sure you're accurate within the 0 0.10, and then you don't have variations with point of impact or other things that can happen when you have different powder charges. You said that's kind of like baking a cake. <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I always uh, use the terminology that if you like to cook and and try different recipes, that's what reloading is about. Um, there are thousands and variations of, of bullet combos and case combos and primer combinations um, for, for any given caliber. So, and even the common calibers like 30-06308, there's an infinite number. So you can really get overwhelmed. Um, you know, my suggestion is to, to keep it simple. You know, start with a couple powders and a 
a couple of different bullets that, that you like or you want to shoot or whatever is applicable for your game, whether that's elk or deer. It's a charge case here. You see the primers in it. It's been resized. We'll just put the powder funnel in. Just pour that in. And that second step of the three steps are complete. You see we have a, have a charge case of powder. So Jimmy, I actually have, <clears throat> I have measurements for every one of my reloads. I'll show you that, some of my data and what I capture. This is a load uh, that's uh, 140 grain Acubon and 7 millimeter 08. It's one of my favorite deer loads, actually all around loads. I do actually load these for a friend or two. Um, this is at a bullet seating depth that I've measured and that, that's uh, measured by my calipers. You know, a lot of people, once they find a load, they just want to shoot that one load and that's fine too. And so in that case, <clears throat> to get to speed up the process of bullet seating, I'll put that up into the die full length and I'll just screw the reloading die down. So it kind of seats right onto that bullet. Again, there's no danger in here of this going off. And I'll take my loaded round that we put the primer and the powder in and I'll put it in the shell holder. And then I'll grab the same bullet <coughs> seat it into the case and then just run it up into the die and you'll feel it you'll feel it enter the case mouth and then slowly be pushed into the case mouth it was really interesting to look at just how many variables there are when it comes to bullets and powders it was something to see just how dialed in you can get a load uh, this is it's important to record all your information whether a load shot good or shot bad Typically what I record is um, all the information relative to the recipe. So the powder charge, the powder type, the primer, the overall length, the ogive length, and the velocity. Um, this is an example of one rifle that I've been working on for quite a few years now. That um, this will be some fits uh, around accuracy. And so as you can see, I've recorded quite a bit of data around what has shot well. Um, you know, obviously I record velocity and I reload for accuracy, not velocity. Um, I think that's an important thing to make. I think you know, people have this view that they need to get a certain velocity out of a certain bullet, and it's um, much more important to get accuracy and precision and to know that your rifle will shoot where you want it to at any given point. And that's one, one gun right there. This is just one gun worth of data. That's one gun. Pretty amazing how much these hand loads can improve accuracy. Well, Jimmy, you had asked a little bit earlier around um, factory ammo versus reload ammo. Here's a good example. Um, I recently acquired a new rifle I've been tinkering with, and um, this first group was the very first group I shot with it. This was Remington 140 grain core lock factory ammo. The second group was a Hornady American whitetail ammo. Uh, my third shot didn't even make it on, on the paper. And then I went to shoot my last shot. It was, um, it was the very first uh, hand load that I put together, the first recipe I put together, and I shot a half-inch group with it. Mm. So that's the difference it can make. That is the difference it can make. Um, don't be surprised when you first start out reloading with a, with a given rifle um, that you know, your groups kind of look like, like this, right? You have some that, that shoot well, some recipes that shoot around an inch. Um, and some that, you know, probably won't make the cut, that are just probably too, too much to be acceptable for some hunters. Okay. And with a little bit of um, time and a little bit of tinkering, recipe adjustments, you can start shooting this, you can start tweaking the groups, tweaking your recipes to get them to shoot like most of the groups you have on here. I have to say I was pretty amazed by what Brian taught me today. To see what a good shooter can do with some well-made reloads when it comes to accuracy was impressive to say the least. So if you're looking for a new hobby and a way to tighten your groups, well, reloading may be for you here in Michigan's Out of Doors.
If you've ever visited the northeast part of the Thumb, you may have heard of Turnip Rock. It's a really cool rock formation that brings people from near and far to check it out. It sits between Grindstone City and Port Austin, and up until recently, one of the only ways you could access it was by kayak. Well, there's a new tour boat in town that makes it a lot easier to get there. On the shores of Lake Huron, between Port Austin and Grindstone City, lies Point Albarks, home to Turnip Rock. It's a breathtaking rock formation and a tourist attraction. A long stretch of private property here makes it difficult to see Turnip Rock except by water. This summer, a new pontoon tour boat is making it a little easier to see the area. So this year, very first year, we have Grindstone Water Sports, LLC, and we are offering pontoon charters with uh, Captain Kevin Ramsey. We'll be taking max six people out to see Turnip Rock and the Port Austin Lighthouse. And also then you could rent two jet skis on your own and go tour the same stuff. Joining us today were my brother Mike, his wife Tina, and their son Elijah. Mike and Tina were celebrating their 33rd wedding anniversary today. As we boarded the boat, Captain Kevin gave us the rundown. Ready to roll? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, how long of a trip we got going? Oh, uh, we're gonna be heading out for about two hours. Um, about the first half of it's gonna be touring the coastline. We're gonna get over by Turnip Rock. We're gonna spend some time there, do a little uh, discussion, and then have, have some chances for some great photo opportunities. Um, after we leave that destination, we'll head out to the Port Austin Lighthouse, the Reef Lighthouse. We can get some great photos there too, and uh, do some discussion on, on the history of that as well. Um, on the way out, we will do a little bit of history based off of what has happened here in Grindstone and how we got to this point. Um, there's a lot of reasons that this harbor has grown the way it has and um, currently is a great sport fishing destination and also uh, a great tourist destination. We were all taking a little time to be tourists today. Also along for the boat tour were Dennis and Kathy Cook, co-owners of the business, and good friend Mike Brown from Bad Axe, who took some time off from Randy's Hunting Center to get some drone footage for us today. Darren and his wife Barbara were accompanying us on the jet skis today too. Captain Kevin narrates the tours out here and spent a little time talking about Turnip Rock. So there's uh, neat rock formations all over the world. and. Um, one of what is known as one of the greatest in America anyways is turnip rock. It's a, it looks and resembles like a turnip because it's narrower at the bottom than it is at the top. It uh, protrudes out of the water maybe 12 or 14 feet right now and um, it's made out of soft sandstone so over the years and it's in the shape of a stack and over the years the, the bottom has worn more than um, the top just because of the water and the hydraulic pressure so it does come up like the shape of a turnip and there are trees growing on top. It's very cool and it uh, sits out just off the shoreline uh, of a, a bunch more features like that connected to land. So there's undermined cave, cavern features, there's uh, a lot of cliff-like features that uh, run along that coast and the only way to access them is from, from the water so that's why this, this boat kind of gives you a chance to do that. And, and one neat little tidbit is uh, Back in the late 1800s, fugitives would actually hide in those caverns off the, off the coast there um, to stay away from authorities. So that was kind of a neat little, little piece of history there too. One of the main reasons that they started this business is uh, there were a lot of calls to the kayak companies that were saying, hey, um, we got a family that we're, we'd rather go as a group. We, we don't feel comfortable being in a kayak, working our way around and seeing these neat little, little pieces on the shoreline. And so they decided, well, if we gave people the opportunity to get together as a group, and also if uh, you maybe wanted an uh, easier way to get to those, those destinations, and we can spend some time out there, you don't have to worry about the water, it's safe, um, and it's a great alternative. From there, we'll go out to the Port Austin Reef Lighthouse, and that's another maybe 15 minute ride. Um, by that point in time, we've covered about six miles and we'll spend some time out there uh, making a few laps around the lighthouse, getting some good footage, getting some good pictures for everybody, and then doing a little bit of history on what's going on out there too. So uh, the lighthouse uh, was built in the late 1800s, and it's there to mark the end of the reef. It's, it's uh, about a mile and a half off the corner of um, Point of Barks, and the water is so shallow on the way out there, uh, a light was uh, required and put there so that people would navigate around it. 
Without that, there was many shipwrecks um, between there and shore um, in times prior to that. And the whole coast is, is um, rippled with, with many reefs like that. So it gives, gives navigation one place to get turned around and, and uh, was a very important part to keeping people safe up on the North Shore here. What an incredible piece of Michigan's history. After taking in the view of the lighthouse, it was time to make our way back to Grindstone Harbor. Darren says this boat tour makes Turnip Rock accessible for just about anyone. Turnip Rock is halfway in between Port Austin and Grindstone, so you could leave from either way, and this is just a long trip for somebody to kayak. So with this option, you can hop on, go see the same thing, you know, take a cooler, have a, a water or burger or whatever you want on the boat, and just enjoy your time on the water without having to worry the physical aspect of it. So the kayaks also is very weather permitting. Uh, depending on which way the wind is from, it gets rough really quick. So with the Tri-Tune, it allows us to go out in rougher water, whereas the kayak trip could get canceled very easily. The boat tour and jet ski rental are great ways to see Turnip Rock and Port Austin Lighthouse. Back on shore, our group was pretty excited. It was super fun. I loved it. It was good. Got to learn something about the area as well from the captain as he uh, gave us a little tour, so it was neat. It was really cool getting to see pictured rock area with the turnip rock from the pontoon boat rather than kayaking this time. A lot less work. <laughs> yeah, definitely less work. Yeah, it's kind of like a mini pictured rocks. It was beautiful. If you find yourself in the thumb of Michigan this summer, be sure to make the journey out to the famous Turnip Rock. It's a beautiful sight to see, and it's right here in Michigan's Out of Doors. Well, everybody, we are here once again at Antlers Fireside Grill, Canadian Lakes, Jim Wood. And Jim, we got a easy summertime recipe for, you said, pretty much any kind of fish. Any fish. And today we're using walleye. And what are we going to do? Let's get this thing started. So this is kind of a spin on a, a southern way of cooking fish, which uh, they'll basically put it on a grill and they won't flip it. Okay. And they'll protect it from drying out with uh, normally a mayo-based dressing. Okay. Um, sometimes just straight mayo, but we're going to make kind of a like a ginger mayo to put on it. Okay. And th this is cedar? cedar? Yep. Okay. This is cedar plank. Now, if you've got a pellet grill, um, you could do it without that. Uh, like a pellet smoker. If you have a regular grill and you don't want to use that, just make sure you keep a skin on okay. because the skin will actually protect it from burning and okay. you, just one side. So Perfect. Well, let's uh, make, what are we going to make here? So first of all, we're going to make just a really quick marinade, which is just two ingredients. And it's just soy sauce and some fresh garlic. Mm. So now I'll make the uh, kind of the dressing that goes on top. And this is going to... This is regular mayonnaise? This is regular mayonnaise, and what this is going to do is A, almost create a sauce hmm. for the fish, and B, help it from um, not drying out. And how long does something like this need to cook on the smoker or on the grill? I mean, it all depends. Um, if you don't want a lot of smoke and you're cooking at a high temperature, it only takes a couple minutes. Okay. Um, if you're going to get a lot of that smoke, which, you know, you want 185 degrees or whatever for okay. that, um, you know, it's, it's going to take, take a little while. Yeah. Okay. So have a little bit of mayo. Just a hint of fresh orange juice. And when you're cooking a thinner piece of fish like this, are you monitoring the inside of it to know when it's done, or is it just kind of a feel thing? Or I mean, with, with walleye, I think part of the reason people like it so much is it flakes. Okay. And if it's flaking, it's done. Okay. Um, you know, walleye is one, fresh walleye is one of those things where you gotta be a really bad cook to overcook it. <laughs> <laughs> or you just gotta forget about it. Well, yeah, there you go. So now we've got some green onion. A little bit of fresh dill, just a little bit of sweet pickle relish, and then some freshly minced ginger. So pretty easy. There's not a lot of prep here. No, there's not. I mean, this is just one of those dishes that you can knock out really quick, and it's, it is slightly impressive. I mean, your guests <laughs> will, will dig it, and they'll think you're good. <laughs> Next, put the walleye on the cedar plank, add a little salt, and the mayonnaise mixture, and it's ready for the grill. Okay, Jim, we pulled this off the grill. What's our next step to plate this? So we're just going to literally uh, put it right on the plate. So you take, okay, take it off of the, take it off yeah. the wood. Yeah, and be careful because, like I said, fresh walleye has a lot of moisture, so it could fall apart on you. Okay. And then what I did. Um, yeah, what would you serve this with typically? If you've never cooked vegetables on your pellet grill, mm. it's 
You should. It's the way to go. Huh. In my opinion, after eating this, it's the only, I mean, it's the only way to eat vegetables. I mean, it, it's so a little olive oil on them maybe and then put them yeah, on? Yeah, oil, stuff. salt, pepper. I mean, if you want to get crazy, you can put some garlic and fresh herbs on it, but mm. salt and pepper and oil is, is the way we prepared them here. Okay, and, and so the name of this dish is? We're just going to call it No Flip Walleye. <laughs> no Flip Walleye it is. Thanks for joining us this week for Michigan Out of Doors. Make sure you stick around in upcoming weeks. We do have a lot more excitement headed your way yet this summer. Now on next week's show, we're gonna take a boat ride with Bob Garner out on Lake Michigan. We'll be fishing out there with him. Always a fun time, you won't wanna miss that. In upcoming weeks, we'll also take a look at some ladies shooting events with handguns. We're gonna do some crop damage hunting, Lots more summertime fishing, all sorts of fun headed your way. If you'd like to see where we are and where we're headed next, you can always check us out online. Well, that's right, Jenny. Online is a great way to kind of keep tabs on us. You can do that on our website. We're also on most of the social media sites, and we're also on YouTube. If you want to subscribe to our channel there, you can get an email every time we post something new. Lots of good stuff coming over the next few weeks. It's hard to believe we're into August now, the summer. We only have about a month or so left, and it's only a month or so until the hunting season starts. So get out and enjoy our great state, and hopefully we'll see you right back here next week on your PBS station. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by... Do you dream of somewhere bigger than your backyard? you can get there with Greenstone. Whether you want to hunt, fish, hike, or just watch the sunset, we're ready to help you own your place in the great outdoors. To learn more, visit GreenstoneFCS.com. DTE believes to lead, we have to do what's right. So we're tripling renewables and cutting carbon emissions in half over the next 10 years. DTE. By G5 Outdoors, makers of the Quest and Prime bows, manufactured and designed in Memphis, Michigan. G5 offers a line of archery bows, broadheads, and accessories on the web at g5outdoors.com. Closed captioning provided by Marvo Mineral, makers of Lucky Buck, deer management products including minerals to supplement deer diets year-round to improve health and antler growth. When I want to fire away I am a Michigan man Changing seasons paint the scene Like rainbow trout in a hidden stream The white-tailed